Hey guys, this is Chris Cottrell with the uh, Dabbler's Den, and I just wanted to put together a quick video introducing and explaining a topic that has fascinated me for nearly two decades. Uh, this is part one of a multi-part series covering Carolina Bay Formation and is uh, based on a presentation that I'm currently working on. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a story of a really, really bad day written all over North America's landscapes, and uh, these Carolina Bays are just a small part of that story. So I hope you learned something from this, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to message me or to leave them in the comments below. <clears throat> I start my presentation with uh, one of my Dabbler's Den videos. Uh, if you're a subscriber already, uh, you may remember a video we put together out at Graham Bay, uh, which is just north of northeast, I'm sorry, just northeast of Valdosta, Georgia. Um, I've been going out there since 1999. Uh, and this is a this is really where my fascination of Carolina Bays began, uh, mainly because they were such a mystery. Uh, no one could tell me how they were formed, including my geology professors uh, at, at VSU. Uh, anyways, we had a great time filming this episode, and if you're interested in watching it, I'll provide a link in the uh, description below. Oops. Uh, okay, so what are Carolina Bays? Uh, these are elliptical shaped. Uh, depressions found all along the east coast of the United States, uh, pretty much in the coastal plain uh, from Georgia all the way up. Uh, they they were first discovered not long after the Wright brothers uh, first achieved manned flight. So basically, once we were able to get high enough uh, into the sky to look down on the ground, people started to notice the same elliptical shapes all over the landscape of uh, coastal of the coastal plains. Um, and now it's important to note that the bays aren't actually named after bodies of water. Uh, even though many of them do contain water, they are actually named after a type of bay tree that is commonly found in the depressions. Uh, and you can see this is a, an example right here of what a bay tree uh, looks like. Now, out of habit, I'm just I'm going to continue to call them bays, uh, but just know that they're actually named after a plant and uh, not a body of water. So you see all these elliptical bays here. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, it's the mystery of the bays that has fascinated me for so long. Um, up until now, we haven't really had a clear understanding as to how they formed. Uh, interestingly enough, though, when they were first discovered, it was thought that a meteor shower uh, or something of an extraterrestrial origin uh, must have formed the elliptical depressions, you know, craters. Uh, and people got really excited about the idea back in the 30s and 40s. But the problem with this hypothesis was a lack of evidence, and, and rightfully so. Um, a meteor, you know, there were no meteor fragments uh, large enough to create the Carolina Bays uh, ever discovered. So it was quickly dismissed by the uh, scientific community. And since then, uh, geologists have come, they've been trying to come up with a terrestrial explanation of the bays. Uh, and it's been hypothesized in the past uh, that their formations may have been the result of really old spring basins. Um, and you can see here, there's just a list of them all the way to... Uh, giant fish nests, uh, much like uh, a cichlid uh, forms a nest, uh, but on a much larger scale. And again, this is pretty ridiculous, if, if you ask me. Uh, right now, the accepted scientific explanation for Carolina Bays is that they are scour marks formed from persistent northwest to west glacial winds. Uh, and you can see here, this kind of demonstrate it, northwest to west winds. Um, uh, during our most recent ice ages, and basically the wind and water erosion over time uh, long periods of time smooth the edges of shallow ponds, making them bigger and piling up sand on the southeast corners, because most of these Carolina Bays do have a, a ridge of sand on the southeast corner. Um, to me, this is a very complex um, explanation, and it really doesn't hold a lot of weight. I mean, they're all so perfectly shaped, it just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, now, as you're going to see, the true explanation for these formations occurred much quicker and uh, was much more dramatic than just wind and water erosion over a long period of time. Um, so while all the Carolina Bays may not be the same size, they are all the same shape for the most part. Uh, they have that elliptical shape. And ironically, um, they are all oriented in the same north, west to southeast direction. They all point to the same spot on a map. Uh, and in my opinion, this should have been a case closed uh, as to the origins of the bays. Uh, they must be secondary impacts from a much larger primary impact that would have occurred in this area, you know, uh, where the Great Lakes are here now in the United States. Um, but again, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with science here, so there has to be evidence of it. And uh, that evidence has been lacking. 
you know, no, no meteor fragments, nothing like that, that would suggest that this was a, a, an impact and the base would have been secondary impacts. But one thing we, that we definitely have to consider is that uh, there was a huge ice sheet sitting on top of North America, uh, the North American continent during the last ice age. And the area where the Carolina Bays uh, point to, again, in this area right here, you know, it had up to two miles of ice on top of it. And again, that's two miles of ice straight up. Um, if a meteorite uh, or more likely a comet fragment were to slam into an area, uh, into this area specifically, uh, I can easily see it sending a cascade of ice boulders and slush balls all over the continent. Um, and, uh, you know, have you ever heard the, you know, that an icicle is the perfect murder weapon? Well, uh, this kind of brings a whole new meaning to that for me. You know, if, if this sent huge ice balls all over, you know, all over North America, uh, the devastation would have been uh, extraordinary. Um, well, anyways, over the past decade or so, Google Earth uh, has become such a powerful tool to help us uh, see the big picture. Uh, if we align all of the known Carolina Bays, uh, all right here, if we align them all, uh, and let's not forget about the uh, the Nebraska rainwater basins. Uh, they're over here in Nebraska. Um, you know, I, sorry, Nebraska, don't mean to leave you out. I'm just I'm a Georgia boy over here. Uh, anyways, they they the same thing. They all point in the same direction uh, that the Carolina Bays point to. So, um, and if we again, if we align all those things up, we adjust for the Coriolis effect and the hang time uh, of these secondary icy impactors. Um, all the arrows point to this location right here, uh, and this is the Saginaw Bay. Uh, and yes, this is a real bay this time. It's not just a plant, but uh, I understand why it was overlooked for so long. Um, you know, but after connecting the dots, it should be clear to see that this entire area right here is indeed um, an impact crater. You know, something came in extraordinarily fast and hit this area. And if you keep in mind that there was two miles of ice on top of that when it occurred, um, you know, it, it should be pretty easy to understand why the evidence has been so hard to gather. Um, it was literally washed away only moments after impact. I mean, the, the amount of energy and the amount of, uh, you know, how quickly it would have occurred, you know, the amount of steam and, and water that would have instantly been created at that time would have completely erased all evidence at that, at that area. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to have a whole video on this uh, here uh, shortly. So there's more on the actual primary impact uh, in another video. Okay, so I want to keep these videos to a, a manageable and digestible length. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up part one here. Um, if this was your first exposure to Carolina Bays, then great, awesome. Uh, I hope you find this topic as intriguing or as interesting as I have. Uh, now, if this is old news to you, uh, then stick around because part two is where things are really going to start to get interesting. Uh, we're going to look at, at some new technology and uh, pairing it with some of our older technology um, and look at how LIDAR is just a total game changer when it comes to, uh, when it comes to seeing the effects of, of an impact and, uh, and their secondary effects. So, so stick around for part two, guys, and, um, and thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks.